A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankara AS Academy. Today's date is 14th of September 2023. Now before getting into the news article discussion, I have to wish all the mains candidates who are going to appear for tomorrow's examination. Just give your best, the rest will be done. So with this positive note, let us move on to the news article discussion. The list of articles that we are going to discuss today are displayed here. So without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It talks about e courts project. It mentions that the union cabinet has approved the third phase of the e courts project. The cabinet has approved 7310 crore rupees for this project. Phase 3 will focus on updating the digital infrastructure of the lower judiciary. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us revise about e courts project. So what is e court first of all? See e court or virtual court is a court in which the filing of cases and the adjudicating process happens over the internet. It reduces the need for the brick and mortar infrastructure. That is, it aims to reduce the need for the people or advocate to be physically present in the court. See, in our country, the e-courts project was conceptualized on the basis of the National Policy and Action Plan for Implementation of ICT in the Indian Judiciary 2005 report. This report was submitted to the government by the e-committee of Supreme Court. So based on this report only, the e-court project was started. The e-court project aims to transform the Indian judiciary by inducting information and communication technology. Now let us take a small detour and see some of the points about the e-committee of Supreme Court. See the e-committee is the governing body charged with overseeing the e-courts project. The CJI is the chairperson of the e-committee. The main objective of the e-committee are interlinking of all courts across the country, making the Indian judicial system IT enabled, enhancing the productivity of Indian judiciary and finally to make the justice delivery system accessible, cost effective, transparent and accountable. Through the e-court project, the e-committee pursues these objectives. Now coming back, let us see how the e-courts project is implemented in India. The e-courts project is being implemented in India in a phased manner and it is a pan-India project. Phase 1 was implemented during 2007 to 2015. Phase 2 was started in 2015 and ended in 2019. Some of the achievements of the two phases include establishment of digital infrastructure across courts, the introduction of a case management system, the introduction of a unique case number record, the launch of the National Judicial Data Grid, NJDG, and the launch of the Interoperable Criminal Justice System, ICJS. Note all these points, very important. Now coming to phase 3. In phase 3, the E-Committee has decided to adopt an ecosystem approach. In digital infrastructure ecosystem approach members, Many stakeholders can access and operate with data simultaneously. This approach will support data sharing across the prison, courts and legal aid. So this is all about the phases implementation of the e-courts project. With this basic information about e-courts project, now let's see the advantages associated with the e court project. First, let us see the advantage the e courts project will bring to the citizens. Here the first one is improved accessibility. The accessibility is improved due to better scheduling mechanism and online digital filing. Next it will bring down the cost of justice. See e-filing and virtual hearings will reduce travel cost thereby reducing the cost of accessing justice. The next advantage is the e-quote will increase transparency through live streaming of case hearings and enhancing access to data. Finally, e-courts are environmentally friendly as the use of paper by the judicial system will come down. Moving forward, let us see the advantages the e court project will bring to lawyers. Firstly, with greater access to information through e courts the advocates can draft better legal strategies. Secondly, since the court records are updated digitally in real time, the need for regular updation of case files by the lawyers will come down. 
now let us see the advantages the e crores project will bring to the judges first advantage here is that the unified digital platform will enable the courts to better track cases secondly with digital courts there will be greater access to information this will help the judges make well informed decisions very easily finally the court will help in effective delivery of justice integration of the judicial system with that of the police prisoners prosecution etc which will improve the speed of information sharing and make the judicial process more efficient these are major advantages of e courts or virtual courts but it also has some issues associated with it the issues include low penetration of the internet in india digital literacy weak digital infrastructure and vulnerability to hacking and cyber security these are some of the pros and cons associated with e courts so these learned points let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this editorial article it talks about sustainability of biofuels in the past we have two options to overcome the problems of conventional fuels one was adopting biofuels and the other was electric vehicles many doubted the use of biofuels because the electric vehicles gained huge popularity but now we came to understand that even the electric vehicle industry has negative effects on the environment so there was growing importance for the use of biofuels that is what the article also highlights here the article speaks about importance of biofuels and the challenges in adopting biofuels in india so in this context let us cover all the important points mentioned in this news article before that the syllabus relevant to the news article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it firstly what is biofuel see any hydrocarbon fuel that is produced from an organic matter here organic matter in the sense living or once living material so when any hydrocarbon fuel is produced from such organic matter in a short period of time then it is considered as a biofuel biofuels may be solid liquid or gaseous in nature see biofuels can be used to replace or can be used in addition to diesel petrol or other fossil fuels for transport and other applications also they can be used to generate heat and electricity now moving on to see different generations of biofuels know that there were four generations of biofuels let us see them one by one first generation biofuel are usually obtained from food crops like broken rice sugar beet corn etc they are generally blended with fossil fuels when blended the greenhouse gas emissions get reduced second generation biofuels are produced from non food crops they are obtained from non food yields for example wood forest waste food crop waste waste vegetable oil industrial waste and ecological biomass crops the second generation biofuels emit less carbon dioxide when compared to the first generation biofuels now let us take the third generation of biofuels third generation biofuels are also known as algae fuel or oil age since they are produced from the algae algae leads to the production of all types of biofuels like biodiesel gasoline butanol propanol and ethanol with high yield now coming to fourth generation of biofuels these biofuels are produced from genetically engineered organisms for example genetically modified cyanobacteria so with this basic understanding now let us see the status of biofuels in india see in india in order to promote biofuels in the country a national policy on biofuels was made by the ministry of new and renewable energy during the year 2009 later in 2018 an upgraded version of national policy on biofuels was introduced in national policy on biofuels 2018 The central government expanded the scope of raw material for biofuel production by allowing use of sugarcane containing materials like sugar beet, sweet sorghum, starch containing materials like corn, cassava and also damaged food grains. The policy has the objective of reaching 20% ethanol blending and 5% biodiesel blending by the year 2030. Moving on to see the challenges in adopting biofuels 
first is low efficiency see some biofuels provide less energy than fossil fuels for example a gallon of ethanol has less energy than a gallon of gasoline secondly they will have impact on land usage as we all know extracting fossil fuels from the ground is expensive which make them costly but producing biofuels also requires land and can impact the production of food crops using farmer land for fuel crops instead of food crops might raise food prices and probably lead to shortages next is regarding biodiversity growing biofuel crops especially genetically modified ones can help farmers make money but having too many of these crops can harm the variety of plants and animals in an area leading to biodiversity loss now moving on to the environmental challenges see many biofuel crops are highly water intensive large scale monoculture of biofuel crops often lead to deforestation so these are all some of the important challenges in use of biofuels make note of them despite these challenges the article suggests that there are many ways in which we can use biofuels in a sustainable manner according to energy transition commission we should use biofuels in place where it is hard to find cleaner alternatives for example it could be a good option for long distance flight and big trucks that cannot easily switch to electric power but for regular cars that use gasoline biomass might not be the best option according to international energy agency in order to achieve zero net emissions worldwide by 2050 we need to make three times more sustainable biofuels by 2030 for this first generation ethanol probably won't help much but second generation ethanol could be a good choice these biofuels must be made in many smaller places close to the raw materials production instead of one big factory now moving on to what can be done to address the challenges associated with adoption of biofuels see biofuels can help in rural and agricultural development in the form of new cash crops promoting the use of biofuels in transportation will help in reducing the crude import bill secondly efforts for producing sustainable biofuels should be made by ensuring use of waste land and municipal waste that get generated in cities thirdly a community based biodiesel distribution program can be tried and fourthly the government should announce a better pricing for ethanol These are all some of the important points given in the news article. See it is tough to find the right balance between making cheaper biofuel on a large scale and transporting them over long distances. So the Global Biofuels Alliance which is the result of our recent G20 summit should play a role in creating new ideas and technologies for getting the materials and making biofuels in smaller local places. So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Now take a look at this news article over 5000 people have died due to flooding in Libya The dead toll is expected to rise further many residents are missing and tens of thousands are now homeless The flooding was caused by a Mediterranean storm named Daniel which hit eastern Libya This is all about the news in this context let us learn some important points about Libya in prelims perspective See Libya is the fourth largest country in Africa it is bounded by Mediterranean Sea to the north Tunisia and Algeria to the west Nigeria and Chad to the south and Sudan and Egypt to the east Libya is almost entirely covered by the Libyan desert Libyan desert is a flat plateau that's part of the Sahara desert the Sahara desert is the world's largest hot desert now coming to its habitation most of libya's people live in cities along the mediterranean sea where the climate is milder than the country's hot desert interior that is why tripoli that is the capital of libya and benghazi the second largest city are both located near the coast almost 25% of libyans live in tripoli and benghazi now we shall see the important rivers of libya see the only large river flowing through libya is 
the river Nile. The northeastern part of Libya borders Egypt and this border is defined by the Nile River. However, the portion of the Nile that flows through Libya is relatively small compared to its overall length. Libya has many seasonal rivers. They are often referred as wadis. They are usually dry and have minimal flow except during occasional rains. Since Libya is a desert, it is so dry that no permanent rivers flow through its boundaries. Water may flow beneath the ground and occasionally seep above ground. So in order to access the water below the desert, Libya built a great man-made river. See the great man-made river is a network of underground pipeline that deliver fresh water to the cities of Libya. Now talking about flora and fauna of Libya, as we discussed earlier, most of Libya is covered by desert and its plants and wildlife reflects these arid conditions. Hyena, fennec foxes, jackals and gazelles roaming the desert and snakes including venomous adders and crates are found throughout the country. Some strips of land near the Libyan coast support native forest of pine, juniper and cypress. The country's coastline is also home to several rare wildlife species. Loggerhead turtles and Egyptian tortoises nest on the country's beaches and share the water with many types of dolphins including the stripped dolphin. Sake falcons and marbled polecats are often spotted close to the coast. The country's largest national park is El Quaif National Park which is known for its sand dunes, wetlands and hilly terrain. The park is home to Egyptian wolves, golden eagle, red foxes, flamingos and other wildlife. That's all regarding this news article. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about the geography of Libya. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. This news article talks about issuing disability certificates to the people above age of 5 inherited with sickle cell disease. This certificate will allow the person to get reservation and benefits of schemes. But the issue here is that the plan to issue certificate has been stuck at three union ministries for nearly three years. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through sickle cell disease in prelims perspective. Let's start with what is sickle cell disease SCD. See sickle cell disease is a group of inherited red blood cell disorders that affect hemoglobin. As you all know hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen throughout the body. Normally these red blood cells are disc shaped and they are flexible enough to move easily through the blood vessels. But in sickle cell disease red blood cells become crescent or sickle shaped due to a genetic mutation. These sickle celled blood cells do not bend or move easily and can block blood flow to the rest of the body. Secondly, this sickle cell dies earlier which can cause a shortage of red blood cells. Both the ways, the disease causes severe harm to a person. Now talking about the causes of the SED, see as I already said it is a genetic disease. To be very specific, it is caused by hemoglobin S which is inherited from both the parents. If either one of the parents contains this hemoglobin S, then it is called sickle cell trite. Sickle cell trite people can live a normal life without any symptoms. So remember, sickle cell trite and SCD are different from each other. Now let's move on to the symptoms of SCD. See generally the symptoms do not occur until the age of 4 months. But the common symptoms are firstly shortage of RBC. This makes the patient anemic and it leads to less oxygen supply and causes fatigue in a person. Secondly, the common symptom is the pain caused due to the clogging of blood. This pain is technically called CRI SES. They can last from hours to days. Thirdly, chronic organ damage can happen in extreme cases like spleen damage. Fourthly, delayed growth and puberty. Apart from this, painful joints caused by arthritis. Also remember, generally with SCD, 
the symptoms may differ according to the organ blocked by SED cells. Okay. Now moving on to the next question, how can we diagnose SED? See, SED can be diagnosed with a simple blood test. Since the government in budget 2023 to 24 has aimed to eradicate SED by 2047 and has launched a national SED anemia elimination mission, currently all states of India are in the screening program to start the treatment earlier. Finally, moving on to the prevention and treatment aspects. See, on prevention aspect, if two individuals with sickle cell trait marry each other, there is a high possibility that their children will have sickle cell disease. So by screening individuals with sickle cell trait before marriage, the spread of disease can be prevented. So Ministry of Tribal Affairs and Health plans to screen at least 7 crore people for SCD within 2025 to 26. On the treatment aspect, SCD can be cured only by bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplantation and the blood transfusion can combat anemia and give cure from pain. This is all about SCD. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this text and context article. This article is about a synthesis report that was released recently by the United Nations Climate Secretariat. See, this report gives us a picture about the progress made by countries in achieving the 2015 Paris Agreement goals. The synthesis report was prepared based on the outcomes of three meetings that were held so far to discuss the achievements made by countries. This is about the article given here. In this context, let us understand some of the important points mentioned in the news article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to the news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. First of all, know that the synthesis report is related to global stock take exercise. Now, what is this global stock take? See, global stock take is nothing but an assessment of climate change action carried out by the world countries. Basically, the global stock take evaluates the progress made on climate action at the global level. By doing this, the global stock take helps the world countries to identify overall gaps in achieving the Paris Agreement goal. Apart from this, it will also provide opportunities to bridge the gaps in achieving the goal. As we saw earlier, the synthesis report provides details about the progress made by the countries in achieving the Paris Agreement goals. If we look closer, it resembles the objectives of the global stock take exercise, right? See, generally, the synthesis report provides some valuable data to carry out global stock take exercise. To put it simply, the global stock take exercise is carried out by looking into the data from the synthesis report. This is how the synthesis report is related to global stock take exercise. How did global stock take come into picture? See, in 2015, COP21 of the United Nations Climate Change Conference was held in Paris. In this conference, most of the world's countries have committed to substantially reduce global greenhouse gas emissions in an effort to limit the rise in global temperature. They agreed to limit the global temperature from rising beyond 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of this 21st century. Apart from this, the countries also agreed that they will pursue or try to limit the increase in global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius as far as possible. These goals lead to the enactment of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement also emphasizes the same goal agreed by the countries in COP21. Based on the Paris Agreement, the countries have laid out their nationally determined contribution NDC. The NDC is nothing but the commitments or goals made by each country to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change. From these points, we can observe that world countries have set a goal to limit greenhouse gas emissions. See, this move is appreciable, but there should be some review mechanism to analyze the progress of countries, right? For this concern, the countries have agreed to periodically review their efforts in containing greenhouse gases. This reviewing mechanism is what called global stock take. See, the global stock take evaluates the progress made on climate action at the global level. And this is how global stock take came into picture. 
Generally, the global stock take is expected to take place once every five years. Note that the first global stock take is going to take place this year. See, the COP28 is going to be held in Dubai this November. So, it is expected that the world leaders will conduct discussion on the global stock take with the help of a recently released synthesis report and the leaders may arrive at significant decisions. So, we have to wait for the outcomes. I hope you got a clear idea about what is global stock take and how it came into existence. Now, we'll see about the important points from the synthesis report. See, overall, the report says that the world is not on the track to achieve Paris Agreement targets. The report validates this concern by highlighting the latest United Nations Emissions Gap Report. See, the 2022 UN Emissions Gap Report states that 23 billion tons of carbon dioxide are required to be cut to keep the emissions in line with Paris agreements. But the report noted that even if we fully implement the current pledges made by countries, it would only cut 2 to 3 billion tons. This will leave an emission gap of around 20 billion tons. By highlighting this data, the synthesis report noted that the world is not on the track to achieve Paris Agreement targets. But at the same time, the report also mentioned that the world countries still have a narrow change to limit the temperature rise by acting together. The report stated that much more ambition was needed to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. The report suggests the countries limit global greenhouse gas emission by 43 percentage by 2030 and further by 60 percentage in 2035 and reach net zero CO2 emissions by 2050 globally. So it is clear that the report is advocating the nations to work together with enhanced goals. This is one important point from the synthesis report. Secondly, the report mentions that the rapid change from fossil fuel to cleaner energy could be disruptive. This is because the rapid change will affect the MSMEs that relies mostly on fossil fuel based commitments. So, the report advocated the countries to ensure that the energy transition should be equitable and inclusive. Thirdly, the report highlights the need for scaling up renewable energy. It says that renewable energy has to be scaled up to meet the Paris Agreement goal in a time-bound manner. Apart from this, the report says that all harmful fossil fuels have to be rapidly eliminated. Fourthly, the report noted that most of the climate action efforts were fragmented and unequally distributed across regions. So it advocates that countries should adopt transparent reporting on climate action efforts. This could enhance understanding between the countries and also facilitates international cooperation. And finally, the report said that the access to climate finance in developing countries need to be enhanced. This will help the developing countries to meet a goal of low greenhouse gas emissions and facilitates climate resilient development. These are all some of the important points mentioned in the synthesis report. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. This article talks about the launch of Ayushman Bhav campaign by President Draupadi Murmu. Actually, it is a campaign that aims to deliver health care services to the last mile of India. Apart from this, it plans to achieve dual goals. They are consolidating the accessibility and availability of services to the underserved people. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about Ayushman Bhav campaign from exam perspective. So what is this Ayushman Bhav campaign? So it is a campaign initiated by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It aims to provide saturation coverage of healthcare services reaching every village and town in the country. I hope you all remember about Ayushman Bharat PM Jan Arogya Yojana in short called as PMJAY. This campaign is built upon the base of the Ayushman Bharat program which is a watershed health program of the country. PMJAY covers 10 crore poor families and provides insurance coverage up to 5 lakh per family per year for secondary and tertiary hospitalization and upgrade the primary health centers to health and welfare centers 
HWC. So this campaign Aishman Bhav is built upon PMJAY. The campaign is a collaborative effort spearheaded by Gram Panchayat with government departments and other locally elected bodies of villages and towns. So with this basic understanding, now let's see about the three components of the campaign. First one is Aishman Apke Dwar 3.0. It aims to provide Aishman cards to remaining eligible beneficiaries enrolled under the PMJAY scheme of Aishman Bharat. Aishman cards will ensure that more individuals have access to essential health services. Secondly, Aishman weekly melas at HWCs and community health centers CHCs. This will facilitate the creation of ABHA IDs or the health IDs and issuing of Aishman Bharat cards. These melas will also offer a variety of services like early diagnosis, comprehensive primary health care services, telecommunication with specialist and appropriate referrals and etc. Thirdly, there are Aishman Shabas which are gathering in every village and panchayats. It will play important roles like distributing Aishman cards, generating AB, HA IDs. There is also a component of raising awareness about vital health schemes and diseases like non-communicable diseases. There is also a component of raising awareness about vital health schemes and diseases like non-communicable diseases. It also includes tuberculosis through Nikshai Mitras and sickle cell disease as well. It also plans for blood donation and organ donation drives. Finally, Aishman Bhav campaign is aligned with the vision of creating healthy villages and healthy gram panchayats and it is working to lay the foundation for achieving universal health coverage in the country which is STG target 3.8. In order to instill the spirit of competitive governance, panchayats that successfully saturate the health scheme will earn the prestigious title of Aishman Gram Panchayat or Aishman Urban Ward. So this is about Aishman Buff campaign. Make note of it, a potential prelims topic. So these learned points and I'll just move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this article from Text and Context page. Recently, a report titled Elephant Corridor of India was released by Union Environment Ministry. According to the report, there are 150 elephant corridors present in India. Out of the 150 reported elephant corridors, 126 are within the political boundaries of states, while 19 are located across two states. Apart from this, there are also six transnational corridors between India and Nepal, primarily in Uttar Pradesh. If we look into state specific data, West Bengal topped the list with 26 elephant corridor. The report further said the intensity of elephant use has increased in 59 corridors. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us learn few points about elephant corridors. See, India is home to around 30,000 elephants, which accounts for 60% of the global population of elephants. The elephants used to travel continuously from one forest habitat to the other to obtain their food. This phenomenon helps in the disposal of seeds which in turn safeguards the forest. Because of this fact only the elephants are regarded as the gardeners of the forest. Now coming to elephant corridors, as we saw just now the elephants continuously move from one forest habitat to another to obtain their food. So there must be some pathways that connect to habitats of elephant, right? This pathway is what is termed as elephant corridors. To put it simply, the elephant corridor refers to the narrow pathway or land strips between two natural habitats of elephants. It connects one natural forest habitat with another habitat. The elephant corridor allows the elephants to move freely from one location to another without coming in contact with humans. Now talking about the threats, land fragmentation is the foremost threat that hinders the movement of elephants from one place to another. This is because land fragmentation often results in the cutting up of two natural habitats of elephants. Apart from this, coal and iron ore mining also threatens the existence of elephant corridors. In states like Jharkhand, Orissa and Chhattisgarh, 
the forest lands were diverted for mining activities because of this most of the animal corridors have vanished in such areas so these are all the threats faced by elephant corridors these threats only aggravate the elephant human conflict see the issue here is if the elephants do not find corridors they can't move from one forest to another so they lack proper food and they end up eating agri lands this is only causing the human elephant conflict now talking about the protection status of elephant corridors see the wildlife protection act 1972 contains certain provisions for protection of wildlife corridors as per the section of wpa the state government can declare certain areas including elephant corridors as conservation reserve or community reserves once declared the corridors fall under the category of protected areas so it accords high protection to the elephant corridors apart from this the government can also declare certain wildlife corridors as heritage sites under the biological diversity act 2002 this also helps in the management and conservation of elephant corridors that's all regarding this new article discussion in this new article discussion we saw in detail about elephant corridors of india report then we saw about what are elephant corridors and their protection status so with these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the new article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now take a look at this first question this question is about national judicial data grid nj dg statement 1 it is implemented under the aegis of the e committee supreme court of india statement 2 it provides a comprehensive database of orders judgments and case details of only district and subordinate courts and high courts statement 3 it promotes transparency and access of information for all the stakeholders you have to find the correct statement here here the correct answer for the question is option b only 2 statement 2 is incorrect see just now we saw in our discussion that our chief justice of india dy chandrachat announced the onboarding of the supreme court on the national judicial data grid njdg so from now on njdg will have data from the supreme court as well so the correct answer for the question is option b only 2 now moving on look at this question about ashman buff campaign statement 1 it seeks to replace the ashman bharat yojana due to its inefficiencies see this statement is actually incorrect because the program itself is built on and complements the ashman bharat scheme instead of replacing them so this statement is incorrect second statement says that the aim of the campaign is to provide saturation coverage of healthcare services reaching every village and town in the country this statement is actually correct statement 3 says it relies more on civil society organization rather than local bodies of government this is incorrect panchayat and other local bodies spearheads the campaign so the correct answer for the question is option a one pair only now moving on this question is about elephant corridors in india statement 1 the state government can notify a certain area in the state as a elephant corridor under the wildlife protection act 1972 this statement is actually correct second statement according to the report from the union environment ministry there are less than 100 elephant corridors in india this statement is actually incorrect as per the report there are 150 elephant corridors in india statement 3 karnataka is having the highest number of elephant corridors in india this statement is also incorrect west bengal is having the highest elephant corridor in india out of 150 elephant corridors 26 are present in west bengal so the correct answer here is option a only one now moving on look at this question daniel storm which was recently seen in the news originated in which of the following water body option a north atlantic ocean option b arabian sea option c mediterranean sea and option d south china sea the correct answer for the question is option c mediterranean Now moving on look at this question about sickle cell disease here three statements are given statement 1 sickle cell disease is a group of inherited red blood cell disorders that affect hemoglobin this statement is actually correct statement 2 it is less prevalent among tribal groups since they had inherent resistivity to it this statement is actually incorrect since the scd prevalence is high among the tribals 
so that ministry of tribal affairs and uh, ministry of health and family welfare is planning to screen 7 crore tribals for sickle cell traits statement 3 recently government of india launched national sickle cell anemia mission to eradicate the disease by 2047 this statement is actually correct so the correct answer for the question is option b only two pass only two pass are correct here okay the main practice questions for today's discussion is displayed here you can go through it once again all the very best for the mains candidates who are going to write exam tomorrow just do well so this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel thank you for listening